Next up, I want to um, stick on our time frames here. Uh, we have two more presentations to go this afternoon. And next up is our friend Jen Gross, and she is with um, Echoes and Reflections. These guys do some fabulous work with um, edu uh, Holocaust education, and she is going to tell us um, about some of the things that they uh, that they do. Um, and again, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the um, in the chat. Uh, we are recording, um, and this stuff will be made available on our website. Uh, you know, after the conference, uh, give us a couple of days to do that if you would, please. And um, without further ado, our friend Jen Gross from Echoes and Reflections. Go ahead, Jen. Thank you so much, um, and it's a pleasure to be here with the FDR Library. You all have been doing some truly outstanding work these past few weeks. Um, the conference on Americans. Um, just a week and a half ago was outstanding and really excited to be back here working with your educators today. Um, so my name is Jen Goss and I am a 19 year social studies veteran uh, classroom educator. I taught for 10 years outside of Reading, Pennsylvania, and then the past nine at Stanton High School in Stanton, Virginia. And um, working with Holocaust education has truly become a large part of my life. Um, my first MA is in Holocaust and Genocide Studies from Westchester University. And for about 16 of my 19 years in the classroom, I taught a Holocaust and Genocide Studies semester elective. And in May, I was given the opportunity to step into a position full-time with Echoes and Reflections as a curriculum and instruction specialist. Uh, and so I've been doing that work in addition to being the Williston Reads Project Fellow for the USC Shoah Foundation. So really delighted to be here today on behalf of Echoes and Reflections. In case you're not familiar with Echoes and Reflections, we are a partnership between the USC Shoah Foundation, the Anti-Defamation League, and Yad Vashem. And we've been around since 2005, and I've actually been really lucky to use this content in my own classroom since 2006. What I really appreciate about it is it is designed in a way to not only help teach students context about the Holocaust with resources that are provided to support teachers in classroom settings, but it also gets them thinking critically about its meaning in the world today, which is certainly a big theme of our work here uh, this afternoon. It also works really well with other resources. Um, in addition to my work with Echoes and Reflections, I'm a United States Holocaust Memorial Museum teacher fellow and use a lot of their resources as well. And I know you're gonna get the opportunity to hear from my colleague, Christina, this afternoon. And so these resources really integrate well together and fit well with an existing curriculum structure. So I'm excited to share with you how to navigate our resources. Um, as well as some of the resources from our partners at the USC Shoah Foundation and um, talk and get you thinking about how these will fit within your own classroom situations. Um, so just a couple goals for today. We are gonna talk a little bit about pedagogical principles and um, we'll also take a look at some specific instructional enhancements to support student learning in your classrooms as well as um, examining some classroom ready assets. And we'll also talk a bit about uh, the Holocaust itself, including the history of anti-Semitism, and along the way, hopefully building your confidence and capacity to teach about this complex subject, as I know that both Jeff and Abby have worked so hard to, with you to do today as well. Um, so our pedagogical principles are the backbone of how our resources are created and supported. For those of you that are familiar with the USHMM guidelines for teaching the Holocaust, you'll notice that there are a lot of similarities. Um, we believe that it is critically important during instruction to define terms. And I'll show you one of the tools that we have to assist in defining these terms. We also feel that it's important whether you are teaching about the Holocaust for one day, a week, or a semester, that you have some inclusion of what anti-Semitism is and how it fits into the bigger picture of the Holocaust in the world at large. Of course, it's incredibly important to provide your students with historical context, and you can do so by both using primary sources and teaching the human story, translating those statistics into people, um, as USHMM so eloquently says, getting students thinking not just about 6 million victims who perished during the Holocaust, but individuals who had lives, hopes, dreams, and families prior to the tragedy and for the survivors beyond. 
We also think it's important to make the Holocaust relevant, um, cautioning, of course, to do so in an appropriate fashion, um, to not draw glib comparisons to political events and, and societal events that are occurring today, but to dig deeper and think about you know, what can we take from this time period to think about it critically um, and think about what lessons we can draw forth into the present to perhaps make better choices in this day and time. We'll be talking about resources that can also help to foster empathy in your students and also to ensure a supportive learning environment, to lead your students safely in and safely out of the content, um, to make sure that the images that you're sharing with students are methodologically and age appropriate, um, and that you have a rationale and that the resources that you're choosing support that rationale. Um, to not go in thinking that you can simulate for your students what it was like to be a part of the Holocaust, because hopefully none of the students in our classroom will ever have that experience in their own lives, and nor do we want to scare them into a situation where they're thinking that it is alike. So as we go throughout the resources that I'm going to share with you in the brief period of time that we have together today, I want you to think about the ways that you currently apply these principles in your planning and instruction. And then perhaps, um, you know, if you have perhaps, you know, maybe made some missteps along the way, what ways you can apply these principles going forward. Um, in one of our recent blogs, I actually shared some very personal experiences that I had as a young Holocaust educator, um, where I made some missteps and then learned from great mentors at both USHMM and through Echoes and Reflections, ways that the principles changed how I teach and approach this topic. And I'll share that blog with you in a list of resources that I'll share at the end of this session. So in working with educators throughout the United States, one of the biggest challenges that we hear is that educators are getting pushback from their districts, from their principals, from their colleagues about Holocaust education. Why are you spending time on this? Or why are you spending so much time on it? Why do you think this is important? And um, fortunately, uh, in the past year and a half, two years, I guess it's been now, we have gotten um, some studies that have shown us the importance of Holocaust education. Um, on one side, we have the Claims Conference study, which has unfortunately shown us that in many states around the United States, the lack of focus on Holocaust education has led to not only a lack of understanding, but also misunderstandings about the Holocaust and also um, some confusion about its importance in our society today. Um, but released just two days prior to the updated claims conference survey, and then unfortunately overshadowed by it, um, Echoes and Reflection has also uh, taken a similar survey, a, su a survey, not a similar survey, um, of college students on their own experiences with Holocaust education. And um, I always share this survey with teachers because I think it's a really important response to that question as to why do you think that it is important to teach about the Holocaust? And we found some really interesting things. We found that um, students who had experienced Holocaust education were much more likely to exhibit social responsibility, to be more justice oriented to be more comfortable with confronting difference uh, in, in, in tolerance, um, and also to exhibit among themselves higher levels of interpersonal tolerance. Um, we also found that students who had experienced Holocaust education were more likely to practice civic efficacy and have stronger intergroup relations. Um, the study ultimately provided strong evidence of the positive impact of Holocaust education on students' attitudes towards diversity, tolerance, and upstander behavior in the face of hate and intolerance. And importantly, it showed that outcomes from this education are sustained over time, and they appeared in students who had left high school and were transitioning into young adulthood. The study also provided strong evidence that the use of survivor testimonies, whether in person or digitally, may be even more effective at developing these positive attributes in students as students who had been exposed to survivor testimony during their Holocaust education scored higher on all of the areas. These findings have important implications for education policy and also for practice discussions amongst our colleagues and our administration. And it's especially true for decisions on how to most efficiently and impactfully deliver Holocaust education to cultivate citizenship values, empathy, respect for differences, and willingness to take action against hate and prejudice in today's challenging political and social environment. 
which is certainly a theme for election day as we tackle this content. Um, so what I'd like to do in our time together today is I'd like to take you first to the Echoes and Reflections website. Um, if you would like to follow along, I will also drop a link uh, to this website in the chat box. And um, at the end of our session, I'm gonna share a quick sheet with you as well that has the links that I'm gonna be sharing with you today. Um, the Echoes and Reflections site itself, the main page um, doesn't usually change. However, the banner across the top advertises upcoming programs, new blogs, and other content, um, and often changes on a weekly basis. The heart and soul of our site is here in the Teach section. And it is in this Teach section that you can take a deeper dive into those pedagogical principles that I just shared with you. It's also where you can go through our lesson plans, which we'll take a look at in a moment. And it's also where you can find some other support materials. One of the first ones that I wanna highlight for you is our audio glossary. This is one of my favorite, favorite features as a classroom teacher. Um, the audio glossary is a resource that I would pin into uh, my learning management system for my students to access during our study of the Holocaust. Um, for a while we used Google Classroom and then we switched over to Canvas, so I made sure to put it in a top module. And um, what's really great about this audio glossary is that students are able, it's open source, they can navigate it um, whenever, wherever, um, and they are able to go in and um, you know, find out as they're reading a word that they may not understand, or a word um, that they you know, don't know how to pronounce, if it's a word that's, that's not native to English speakers. And um, they hover over the speaker. Auschwitz. It pronounces that word for them. Um, I think it's also a great tool for us as educators because no longer do you have to fumble around how to say Belgitz or Maidanic. You can go into the audio glossary and practice. I sure wish I had this tool back when I started teaching the Holocaust in 2004 because um, my students would have been treated to proper pronunciations much sooner. Um, also in this left-hand navigation bar, you'll see our timeline of the Holocaust. Uh, this is a fairly new resource for us. It is also a resource that is in most constant change. Um, and it is one of our slower loading assets. So I'm just gonna give it a moment here to load. Um, when it comes up, um, you have various ways that you can interact with the timeline. Um, one way that you can interact with it is you can simply just scroll down um, and begin navigating from 1933 through 1945, or you can click on a year like 1944 um, and go into certainly an FDR related event here with the establishment of the War Refugee Board. Every event has the date and what the event is, and then some type of primary source image. And then when you click on it, you can get a bigger description on the topic itself, uh, and then also be treated to other primary and secondary sources related to the topic. Um, in this case, of course, we have a meeting of the Refugee Committee in March of 1944. Um, and then here we have the testimony of Ruth Ruber, who um, speaks specifically on the formation of the War Refugee Board. Um, and so as you scroll down through a year, um, you can go back into the year and you can go down through. And of course, there's other um, pieces that align with the War Refugee Board and FDR. Um, and you can go down through and see the specific events um, and go all the way into 1945. Um, so there are a lot of, of different ways that you can bring in um, various themes through the timeline. On the left-hand side, if you click on the um, pop-out, we have classroom activities that are specific to the timeline itself. We also have a PDF of the timeline. And then we also have it, um, our timeline asset guide, which lists every single primary and secondary source that is in the timeline. So you can open it up, you can do a control F, you can find a resource that'll fit into your classroom needs and be ready to roll. So the timeline is, in my opinion, one of the biggest gems that we have on our site. Um, and there's just so many different ways you can use it. You can use it to demonstrate the 10 stages of genocide. You can use it to find events specific to America and the Holocaust or FDR's intersections with the Holocaust itself, et cetera. 
Lastly, I'm going to take us into our lesson plans. Um, our lesson plans are arranged in units. Theoretically, you could start at unit one and teach all the way through um, to unit 11, which looks at the all important topic of contemporary anti Semitism. Um, and uh, this, the units are also designed though that you can go into each unit and teach just that unit um, based on the amount of time that you have. Or you can also go in and pick and pull resources um, based on your own particular needs. Um, so I'm going to start us out in unit one on studying the Holocaust and just show you how the unit is set up. Every single unit um, takes us from an opening quote, which is typically pulled from a testimony that is in that unit. Um, this particular opening quote comes to us from Leon Bass, who is an African-American liberator who came from outside of Philadelphia and was part of the liberation of Dachau. Um, and then there are key words related to the unit on the right-hand side of the screen that you can hover over. Then every unit also has some background information. If you're an educator that's newer to the topic or if it's been a while since you've taught it, you can drop down and take kind of a little mini crash course on some things to know before teaching this topic. Then we also have for each unit essential questions and objectives, which are great for forming your lesson plans if you're required to create those. Um, and then on the right hand side for every unit, we also have pinned our common core standard alignments for that unit. And then we have our testimony video guide, which is every single testimony that is available through Echoes and Reflections. And it's arranged by um, the unit, the lesson plan within the unit, the speaker, and then what the speaker is speaking about, as well as the time. So if you know, for example, that you are going to be teaching about Kristallnacht coming up, you can control F, you can start to type in Kristallnacht and you'll see that it's mentioned in three places. So you can scroll down and see, okay, Esther Clifford and Kurt Messerschmidt both deliver testimonies on Kristallnacht and you can look at the links. So it's a great instructional planning tool. We also do the same thing with our assets. All of the assets throughout the 11 units are organized in a similar fashion here. And then pinned at the top of every unit, we also have a really great fillable graphic organizer that it can be used to reflect on any of the over six dozen testimonies that are available throughout Echoes and Reflections. Um, so you can take again and put this into whatever learning management system you're using, have your students fill it out and then have them turn it back in to you. Um, and so they can type in the survivor's name, do a summary of what they're saying, the survivor's emotions, and then also their own personal responses. And then it gets them to dig a little deeper into thinking about how survivor testimony is a valuable primary source. Um, and then information that they gained as well as some limitations, you know, realistically getting them to think about testimony as a tool for learning. Um, and you can have them fill out multiple copies of this if you're doing multiple survivors. But in our first five units currently, all of our PDFs are fillable um, and work really great in every learning management system that I've ever worked with teachers in. Um, we are currently revamping units six through 10. Um, they will launch in the beginning of January and all of those will then have fillable PDFs as well. Um, and additionally, unit 11 on contemporary anti-Semitism already has fillable PDFs. So again, great, great, easy to use tools in this constantly changing environment that we're finding ourselves in. Um, the lesson plans for each unit, there are two to three lesson plans. Um, this one starts out by building a foundation for studying the Holocaust, getting students thinking about what they already know, what is their prior information, where did they get it from, and then thinking about why um, studying the Holocaust is important. And so we provide some graphic organizer structures. We provide testimonies to get them thinking about it. Some of you may recognize Roman Kent and here's Leon Bass. Um, and as we go down through, you know, it's really about these essential questions, getting students to inquire, to think, to discover, um, and to build as they go through on the prior knowledge that they have either from your class or even from prior classes where perhaps they haven't talked about the Holocaust, but they've talked about stereotyping, they've talked about discrimination, um, building in those appropriate connections to other areas in history. 
One of my most favorite activities to share with educators is here um, in this particular unit. Um, and it is on Holocaust definitions. It sounds like a very simplistic activity, um, but it's one that I feel you can really do a lot with. And so I'm going to um, give you all just a few moments to take a look at it. Um, the definitions themselves, I will share with you in the chat box and also display on my screen. Um, and I'm gonna put them in right now. And then with the definitions, there is also a graphic organizer that if you want to play with uh, while we're working through this, you can. Um, the graphic organizer, again, fillable, gets students diving into the definitions. So what I'm gonna have you do first is I'm gonna have you just um, examine the definitions. Um, and they are, again, displayed on my screen if you don't wanna open up a separate window. Um, and just let's take a look for about the next five minutes, go through each definition and make some notes about similarities and differences that you're seeing. Um, and I'll put these instructions as well in the chat box. Maybe look at the years, the perpetrators, the victims. What do you see within these definitions? So let's take five minutes and just study these definitions. Um, some general share outs, um, what you saw, what stood out to you. And if you'd like to share out loud, feel free to unmute uh, yourself and I'll call on you. Otherwise, you can also feel free to share in the chat box. And I know we've got that post lunch slump, but let's hear from let's hear some voices or hear some thoughts in the chat box. Well, I'll, I'll get us started. The thing I think right. is what I like about it is just how decisive the the terminology is. You know, um, you know this idea of unprecedented systematic murder. Um, you know, targeted, enslaved, and murder. You know, it just it really lays it out and spells out specifically what was going on. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, and, and Becca mentions the universal word of systematic is very important. Catherine mentions the very specific targets. Fox mentions the power of language. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Those are some, the words that are used are very powerful. Anything else stand out to anyone? Becca also mentions the Imperial War Museum's breakdown, a very balanced and descriptive definition. So again, keep, feel free to keep sharing in the chat box. I'll just talk a little bit about how I've used this activity with my students um, and the different ways you can do it in a leveled format. If you're working with middle school students, you can give them this handout and place them into homogeneous groups around a specific definition and have students identify words that they don't understand and use either the Echo's audio glossary or a traditional definition, um, or excuse me, traditional dictionary uh, to define words that they don't understand. Um, and then do the, the graphic organizer that I shared with you. Um, then you can also um, at the high school level take the same approach, put them into homogeneous groups, have them unpack the definition, and then reorganize them, jigsaw them into heterogeneous groups, then discuss the different definitions. Um, in the chat box, you know, I see Susan mentions two out of the three sources mention other victims besides Jewish people, but Dave points out that Yad Vashem's definition does not mention other victims beyond the Jewish people. Um, and um, Tiffany also mentions that Yad Vashem seems to have words with more emotional connotations. That's really interesting, Tiffany. Unprecedented, perpetrated, dispossessed. And so what I love about this activity is it can be a very simple, here's a definition, let's you know, go through, pick out these things, compare, contrast, and move forward. Or you can move it into the next level with students. You can talk about institutional purpose through definitions because the mission of Yad Vashem is very different than the mission of USHMM. It's very different from the mission of the Imperial War Museum. So you can get students thinking um, at, at a deeper level about institutional purpose and how that can shape definitions. 
What's also really fascinating to kind of give you a behind the scenes glimpse at this activity is that prior to 2013, when the International Holocaust Remembrance Authority asked its member organizations to kind of streamline their definitions a little bit, these definitions were even more different than they are here on this page. Um, and so they, the institutions decided to try and attempt to come up with more common definitions, but still institutional purpose plays a role. Um, but in each of the definitions, Jews are placed as the primary victims, though, as David points out, you know, the Imperial War Museum doesn't mention the specific number of Jews that were killed, um, whereas the other definitions do focus on the numbers. Um, but the Imperial War Museum, you know, you can see the shift in focus to, um, you know, the Second World War, which would be part of their mission. Um, whereas Yad Vashem is looking specifically at the Jewish victims who today we define as the victims of the Holocaust itself. Um, and then the USHMM definition kind of almost breaks them down into those who were um, persecuted and murdered, as well as those who were targeted and those who were persecuted. So there's almost like different um, levels in a way of how people were targeted based on which groups that they fell into. Um, so you can take a really quick look at the definitions, or you can take a much deeper dive, depending on um, the amount of time that you have in the classroom. And that's one of the things that I love about this particular activity. Um, before we head over to eyewitness, I did also just want to highlight two of our other units. Um, our unit on anti-Semitism has some really great resources to introduce that topic. In my U.S. history course, I only had two days to teach about the Holocaust, which after having a semester course, um, my other blocks of the day really didn't seem adequate. Um, but one way I was able to navigate that short amount of time was to utilize resources from this unit to teach anti-Semitism. You can either pair two testimonies from Henry Sinison showing kind of before Nazi um, takeover and after, or you can pair two testimonies from Margaret Lambert, one from this unit and one from the following unit to just show the change on a person um, that the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of the Nazi party had to really personalize that history. Um, and then you can also take a look at, we have a definition of anti-Semitism available here, which helps students understand what it is. And then if you do have additional time, we also have some great pieces to study Nazi propaganda. How do you take and turn um, an entire nation of people theoretically against a very small part of the population, less than 1%? And propaganda, of course, plays a big role in that because students always want to know how could this have happened? And of course, the study of propaganda has so many important implications for today as well. We also have our unit on contemporary anti-Semitism. Um, and I will personally speak from experience that I, um, as a non-Jewish individual teaching about the Holocaust, was very um, nervous and anxious about teaching about anti-Semitism as it has upticked in recent years. Um, I can remember in my early years of teaching the topic that I had to work very hard to find examples of anti-Semitic actions in society. And unfortunately today, they're, they're just way too um, prominent. But uh, this unit, when it was created and released four and a half years ago, really was beneficial to me as an educator to give me confidence and comfortability in uh, addressing this topic. Um, so I strongly recommend that um, you take a look at this, not only um, for the purpose of teaching about it, but you also never know when an anti-Semitic event is going to occur in your community, unfortunately. And this unit provides some great tools for us and our colleagues to be more comfortable with addressing the topic if and when it comes up. Um, so I'll briefly take any questions that you might have on the resources here in Echoes and Reflections. If you have any questions, please feel free to lob them into the chat box. Um, but I'm also gonna spend a very, very short amount of time today sharing with you the resources from our partners um, at the USC Shoah Foundation and their eyewitness platform. So Jonah, I, I saw you just came up. Did you have a question? I, I did. It's kind of a like, question with a comment. Um, so I noticed that so much of the content, which is political uh, history, uh, it's, you know, it's the, it's the, um, the war aspect. There's a, but a lot of it seems like an adult world. 
Okay, you know, we're talking about our parents, our grandparents back then. Okay, and we're trying to reach children, uh, young people anyway, uh, middle school, high school, whatnot. Um, and, and I and I wonder what sort of content is out there from a 12 year old standpoint, from a 15 year old standpoint, from a 17 year old. Because they were, you know, back then you were very, uh, you know, uh, uh, your parents were totally in charge, right? So the, those people, those kids, I just try to imagine, can't imagine what it was like for them as children in the household, watching their parents, watching their younger siblings, having, being absolutely powerless. Um, I, 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 I wonder to what extent the children might, in, in schools, might relate better if it was a story from a 14 year old. Uh, and, and of course you have to go back in history to get those stories. So it would have to be old films or testimony uh, of when I was a kid. That's one of the reasons I thought uh, Paula's mom's boobies uh, story was so cool. When I was reading, I was reading about her when she was you know, young and trying to get married and you know, boyfriends. And anyway, uh, is there content that is going to where the students can relate. Oh, that's like me. I was, I'm that age. Look at that girl. She wanted to go to, you know, date a boy. She wanted to go to a dance or whatever they would do. Um, I just wonder what, what resources you might have, or do you ever get, go in that direction? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I, um, in this very quick glimpse, I must've um, kind of gone a little too far past that. All of our testimonies that are featured throughout, and I'm going to share this one with you really quick. Um, are of individuals who were teenagers or young uh, preteens during the era of the Holocaust. So they're speaking of their experiences as if as they were that age, the age of our students during this time period. Um, and then like the propaganda examples that we've curated, they're from the children's books of that time period that, that these young people would have been exposed to. So the resources that we're choosing are very specifically geared and also have been shown to really resonate with students. So I'm going to share with you very quickly this testimony from Margaret Lambert, which I think really helps to answer that question and show how, how kids can connect with her today. While you're about to do that, I just want to finish. Oh, God. Uh, this is where virtual reality, AI technology, uh, that sometimes oh, called wonderful. fakes. If, if I, I just imagine if we could be hearing from Margaret, uh, generated as a fourteen-year-old, or you know, if if we're, uh, yeah, because you can't get you know. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So here she is, and and I will say from using her testimony for fifteen years, my kids loved her, and even my hardest kids bought in as soon as they heard her time I had uh, my mother and father and I had uh, uh, an older brother about two years older than I and uh, once we got over the sibling rivalry we got to be very good friends my brother and I and um, my parents um, found out pretty soon that what Margaret wanted <laughs> Margaret got and um, they let me be my own, because I was not the uh, usual child. But uh, I, uh, I had my own way of dressing. I didn't like what my mother got for me. I, I wouldn't wear it. And um, I was strong-willed. And I, had, uh, I knew what I wanted to do uh, very early on in life. I wanted to be a coach, physical education teacher, my parents thought I was a little freaky with all this business about sports that I was so very into. I skated, I skied, I swam, I uh, ran, I climbed. Through my sport activities, there were more non-Jewish people involved than Jewish people. I was the only girl in my class. I was the only Jew in my class, and it never made any difference. I mean, I never felt any anti-Semitism until a certain time. I always knew I was Jewish, but uh, um, our house, there was no, no uh, uh, religion practiced really. <laughs> I always say, my father said, be a decent human being, that should be your religion. And I think I have practiced that pretty much. Yeah, so Margaret's always been a favorite of my students. They, they love her, they wanna know what happens with her. Um, and, you know, they really, there's a lot of buy-in. They want, they want to know what's next. Um, so speaking of different technologies, I'm now on the page of um, the USC 
uh, Shoah Foundation's eyewitness platform. And Tiffany mentions Jojo Rabbit, which there's a, a, a link in this page to teaching with Jojo Rabbit and testimony and primary sources, which is really great. Um, USC Shoah Foundation was created out of the survivors of the Shoah Foundation, which was founded by Steven Spielberg upon making Schindler's List. He set out to preserve as many testimonies of Holocaust survivors, liberators, um, and rescuers as possible. And to everybody's um, complete surprise, they collected over 52,000 testimonies um, that are now housed since 2006 at the University of Southern California. They have since been added to of testimonies of survivors of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, the Guatemalan genocide, the Armenian genocide, the Cambodian genocide, and even voices from the current crisis against the Rohingya. An easy way to use eyewitness is through the watch feature, which lets you uh, browse through dozens of pre-curated topics that are carefully historically vetted so that you have um, accurate testimonies at your disposal, because as we know, testimony can be fallible. Um, you can also sort them by language, so you can make um, testimonies available to your non-native English-speaking students, perhaps in their native language. And the testimonies span from um, topics that are related directly to the Holocaust in that era, like the Hitler Youth, um, to more general topics like immigration, indifference, intolerance. There's even a category on civil rights in America. There's great supporting secondary source content on the right, and there's also some more fabulous fillable PDFs um, that can not only be used to analyze testimony, but other primary sources, and that can also be used outside of the realm of teaching about the Holocaust and genocide. I use them across my curriculum, and we're even beginning to build in some primary education pieces to work with our primary education work um, on um, the children's book that Dr. Ruth wrote, as well as uh, the, the young people's uh, book on the children of Williston Lane, which is called Hold On To Your Music. As you get more deep into Eyewitness, which is a free platform available to teachers across the United States and the world, um, you can create students and groups and assign them activities. We have activities um, across every different um, genocide that is available. Um, as well as um, the various types of activities, including what we call our info quests, our, uh, which get students thinking about word clouds and words that stand out, mini quests, which have varying product outcomes, video activities that have students building their own um, videos through the WeVideo platform, geo stories, which bring in um, geographical uh, place and space um, tie-ins. And then we also have our dimensions in testimony. Um, and the dimensions and testimony piece um, takes a look at um, the experience in this case of Pincus Butcher. Um, and I'm just going to share with you how it works. Um, you actually have the opportunity to have a conversation with the dimension and testimony um, that was created by the USC Shoah Foundation, where your students can ask Pincus questions. And so we're just going to ask him some very quickly because I know we're coming to the end of our time. How old are you? I was born in 1932, so you can make your own arithmetic. What is your favorite food? My favorite food is gefilte fish that I make according to the way my mother used to make it. What is your favorite football team? I do not have an answer for that question. So as you can see, we can obviously ask him far more serious questions, but with our limited time, I just wanted to give you an, you know, an sampling of stuff that kids will ask him um, and how he responds. But then he does have more lengthy answers on like his experiences with anti-Semitism, his story during the Holocaust, et cetera. Um, and what's really great is this particular activity focuses on pre-war Jewish life, but you have the ability to edit it as you become more uh, competent at using eyewitness to make it work within whatever curricular goals that you have, or you can create your own activities. So eyewitness is amazing. Um, and it's definitely um, a piece that I would strongly recommend that you dive into when you have a chance. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for having me today. It was kind of a sprint, um, but I hope it was a useful sprint. 
And I do want to share with everybody in the chat box um, a copy of a document that I've created um, that has links to what we have looked at today. Um, if anybody wants to refer to that, um, I will drop that link in the chat box. But at this time, I'll also open the floor for questions. Well, Jen, I'm, I'm just going to say uh, it certainly was a sprint, but uh, as I said this morning, you know, one of the things we're looking to do here is plant seeds, get folks excited about the kinds of resources that are out there and the stuff that you've provided. It's just absolutely fan fantastic. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> I love the graphic organizers. I mean, it just makes it so easy for students to follow along. You know, it takes away the excuse of, oh, I don't know how to organize this. Well, put it in the graphic organizer. It's just been been wonderful to have you here. And, uh, you know, now, now, did you guys do something in the fall? I, I can't remember this entirely, and I may be remembering it incorrectly, but was there, didn't you guys offer some kind of in-class workshops that... Um, so we're, we do, we occasionally do have some um, student facing like open platforms during the day that students can get into with like with us or USC SHOA and in the um, spring semester we're rolling out uh, student facing platforms. So that's something to stay tuned for as well. And then I should also mention, you know, we're constantly doing webinars, um, you know, we're doing workshops and stuff so you can check all of those out on the uh, website as well as to some upcoming things that we have. That's that's wonderful. And thank you so much for presenting. And you know, thank you for the work that, that your organization is doing. And again, it's another, you know, wonderful resource, another voice in the mix here that teachers can um, you know can pick from and and uh, you know fill out their their repertoire in terms of, of talking about um, you know the, the Holocaust. I, I also I love the way you guys have got everything broken down into little sections. So it's not overwhelming. A lot of material, but it's not overwhelming. You know, easily accessible, easily usable, and that is just wonderful. So thank you so much for for presenting for us. Thank you. Yeah, and you guys are all going to be in for a treat. My my dear friend uh, Christina is up next, and you're you're going to be in for even more great content and resources. So Christina, it's always a nice surprise to see you as well. And I know everybody is really going to enjoy what she has to share. So thank you so much for having me. And um, you know, I look forward to continuing our work together. Absolutely. And see everybody, that's the kind of community that I'm talking about, right? Um, you know, getting to know each other, getting to, uh, you know, share with each other. That's, that's what we're looking for here. And that's, that's just absolutely wonderful. 